overcoming the mentality of wide angle shooting in telephoto mode, good for composition, but the physical act of recognizing the composition and then being able to shoot for it kind of looks like this. I go background to foreground. This is a three step blended focus. So one, two, and three. So two is really just for those cherry blossoms on the right. You can kind of see that background, middle ground, foreground. There's a little bit of wind in between these and really looking at it closely, uh, lower left, I probably could have used one more uh, focal point there because I was focusing on the top of the image. So sometimes you get it all, um, but even with this, it still looks a lot different, right? So we have this, this to make this. After a little bit of editing, and keep in mind, these are not edited at all. I just took these basically straight out of camera with the input LUT the camera, Provia LUT from Fujifilm. And then there's some quick editing there just at the end. So it's pretty fun. And let's go ahead and dive into sort of how this is, how this works. And from a standpoint of time for this, we didn't really lose any time. We're just going to kind of maximize the time. So this is that shot that I showed you here, right? Now, sometimes it's not that difficult. And what I mean by difficult is there may only be a couple different shots that we need. So if I compared these, and this is, again, this is shooting wide angle, though, not telephoto, because it definitely has, uh, let's see, let's get hide this stuff, too. It definitely has the same issues when you're shooting extremely close to an object. So <laughs> I can't even get the cigarette there. That's definitely very Roman. But you can see here very clearly an A, B kind of situation or one and two. So if we did the same thing again here, some of the other ones, and it's also kind of important to point out that this can be because of the camera itself. So let's zoom out of this one a little bit because it's a little too far, but we can kind of see this. So this is a uh, Northern Iceland and using the foreground and not having the foreground in focus. So these are fairly simple. We don't need any additional software. Photoshop can probably solve it. Uh, Photoshop is getting better and better with every leaf in terms of being able to stack these things. But to be honest, uh, it's, it's only good to start with that. Let me go ahead and close these questions out. Let's take a look at these both in Photoshop and we can do some editing there. So let me go ahead and just uh, pretty easy. So the, I have these two images. And we'll add the open file things that have things change. That's called focus breathing. When you move the focus ring, it breathes. Uh, I guess I don't know why they call it focus breathing. Plenty of YouTube's, YouTubers probably know. I just know that as you move that focus, you rack that focus, the pixels move too, right? So what we want to do when it's a big discrepancy of focus here is we can align them. And in Photoshop, the alignment tools are pretty good. So we can auto align the layers, basic defaults. It'll do a calculation really quick and it'll then put them together. So you can see, even though we had that lens breathing before, now those edges line up for the most part, right? All of those points of detail. So something like this is not that difficult to blend. In Photoshop, it's actually pretty easy. For example, we just have one image, which is the background, second image, uh, which is the foreground. So this is where your left or right brain comes into play. I like to build things up. So I tend to focus on the background first, then the foreground. So in this case, I'm just gonna create a simple mask and I'm gonna figure out at what point does the focus harmonize? I'm not actually singing, we use harmony in general terms. And it looks like it's right around here. So when I look at the background, this is all in focus. When I look at the foreground, this is out of focus, but right around the middle, right around there seems to be right. And I can put a guide there just to kind of tell and represent exactly where that is. And I'll zoom that back out and just use the gradient tool. And we want to have this part visible and we're gonna create a subtle transition between them. And you can see it's not a critical line that we're drawing, it's just a very basic line. So from here to here, we'll go ahead and hide those guides too. Now, because there is focused breathing, it's one of those things. You are gonna end up with some scaling issues here. So just keep that in mind when you're cropping the final photo, you don't really wanna have these edges. So there are a couple of different ways to do that. We can use the crop tool or we can do a canvas size or any number of different things there. So this is a pretty easy one. So when you're just doing two, you don't really have to do too many 
fancy things. We can just kind of identify them. And Rome is a little bit the same, but it's a very, very close focal point. So let's take a look at this one too. Now, if it's very, very similar, this one we could see the breathing was really bad. But in these images of Rome, and we'll just go ahead and bring these into Photoshop as well. And what I'm going to do this time is just copy it out and paste it on top. So we have both of these layers. Perfect. All right. So background, foreground, zooming in here, it does shift a little bit. See how it shifts? But it's a minor shift. And if we look at the detail, because I'm shooting with a wide angle lens and the focus is not that crazy of a difference, I might and not even need to do that uh, alignment. And I'll kind of show you here. So finding the point where they're both about the same is going to be right, right about here. Same thing, the gradient. And we can kind of go just like this. And then the new tools that you've updated, uh, Photoshop. This is a long time coming that they give you the visual cue of exactly what's happening. So even though oh, I didn't align those, you can see we're not really noticing. And you can see it move now, but even if you forget to align it, if it's really simple, it's, it's pretty simple. So we can kind of bring these things back into focus, which is kind of nice. And, and again, um, it can be a really cool way to do this. And of course, I did the wrong one, which is fine. So there we go. So focused, midpoint, point, pretty good. So, so far, so good. That's the, uh, say the easy ones. And another thing too, I, I should point this out and I can point this out uh, on this image. You don't always have to focus bracket. Telephoto through objects, through cherry blossoms, absolutely. Uh, wide angle shots, if there's a, a deep foreground element like this rock, for example, and it's right there, um, then yeah, obviously. But if you're shooting wide angle and you have an APS-C camera, you probably won't see a difference with the wide angle lens, 14 millimeter, 16, even 18 millimeter. As the camera sensors go up in size, they go, but they also have sort of a different focal range tolerance. What I mean by that is with a small, it's a little higher than it's red. In other words, when you are shooting a wide angle shot with a APS-C camera, you get a lot more uh, sharpness in the foreground. You get a lot more in focus. Moving up to full frame, a little bit, a bit less. Less, uh, moving up to medium around you know, get a angle. So there are pros and cons to larger sensors, uh, not just pros to larger to not things that they don't have to, uh, unless I'm really bored and I want to overdo things. So let's take a look at something a little bit more, more complicated. So we did this is the Osaka Castle image that I did before, and it has different levels here. So on the combined one, there we go. Let me put this in the end. There we go. Okay, see how it works. It's kind of nice with the compare tool because I can I can kind of roll through these. And what, and I'm doing this in camera um, from the uh, photo Japan. That's good. so. Uh, what I was showing here is what I'm doing is rolling through the focus on my own, and I'm doing that. And I can't just run out. I could run out on thunderstorm and show you how to do this, but it would be a little weird. And I'm sure I lose internet. I'm doing it uh, manually, and in this case, what I'm doing is I'm doing it with the autofocus. So I'm basically, and this will take a second to load again because we all know that the internet's going to. So I'm focusing on the background. And then what I'll do is I'll move it to the other areas of focus, take a photo, and then move that focus square there. And again, sorry, guys, it's not going to load. But basically, and these will be available online, I think the second week of July, these actually get released. So I'll just move it, focus one, focus two, focus three, and focus four. So I'm doing that manually, and I'm doing it visually using focus peaking. So the, the focus peaking really helps kind of nail that in, dial it in so you can see, make it the most obnoxious complementary color you can. If you're shooting on blue, change it to red. If you're shooting on warm, change it to blue. Just make it as, as loud and ugly as you can because then you'll know it's actually in focus. So when we start to look at this, it gets a little bit more complicated. So three stages and four stages, a lot of different factors come into play. Well, one, uh, things like this only work if there's no wind. And, we, you know, granted, we can do a lot of stuff in Photoshop, but do we really want to have to do all that? And the answer is no. So if I load this into Photoshop, I'm not going to show you how to make Photoshop fail because it usually will. And if you're going to be doing this for, uh, if you're doing photography, whether it's fun or for a living, if you're going to be investing time in focus stacking, and focus bracketing in the field, 
it's better to know the limitations first. So taking these two after alignment, the way that you would go about it is with, let's get back to the main screen. We align them and then we'd actually blend them and it gives you uh, the way to stack images together. It'll create um, the masks. Uh, don't ever click on the fill transparent areas and it'll basically give you the masks and then it'll put it all together. And then when you try to edit the masks, it's uh, less than good. So I'm sure they're working on one of the NVIDIA AI functions that'll let us do this a little bit easier. But for now, what we're actually going to rely on is a different piece of software. The software itself, the way that we use it as photographers that are doing landscape stuff is, is pretty simple. But macro photographers use this too. And they use it to a degree that, that we are shamed by. So let's say three, four, six, 12 images. They're doing this with 350, right? And when I shoot these, and I just, I should show it because we'll put all these together. And we actually have these four levels. If I did it in camera and I tried that in camera, the camera will take different stages. So in order to get all of this one at Himeji Castle, kind of noticing a Japanese theme to everything, the camera decided, or I decided with camera settings, that it needed all of these variations. And it's hard to say if it did or not, because I wasn't watching what the camera was doing, but this probably could have been solved with three or four manual ones. So if you're using the internal to let it go, that's fine. You're just going to have a lot of images. And if there's wind, a lot more can go wrong. If you have the chance where these elements are really separated, highly recommend doing it this way. So we'll do these and we'll do them in order. So we have this one. That's three. Let's go ahead and take a look at those. That's the three stage Osaka Castle. And I'm going to be using Helicon Focus for this, or Helicon, Helicon, Helicon. I have no idea. Um, well, I haven't asked them. I call it Helicon, and somebody always corrects me if I call it Helicon. Uh, yeah, you kind of get the idea. So it didn't actually add those. We'll go and put these three images in. OK, so this is a really cool piece of software. It's made to handle very complex things. Uh, there's also a camera control. Um, it's uh, a uh, Helicon remote. I think it only works for Canon cameras for some reason, but it allows you to do this in the field with the additional tool, which is nice. Now, I'm not going to go over all the settings. If you read about these, they're, they're fascinating ways that it separates frequency of pixels. But method C for landscape photography, the pyramid method, measures the frequency of the pixels, which is kind of cool if you think about that in visual terms. And with everything you bring in, in here, whether it's two, three, 300, uh, my method that usually works every time is C. And when I render this, this is going to look pretty cool. So notice how it's finding and detecting those edges and how fast it did that. And if I zoom in on this a little bit and uh, just just be warned that, um, you know, the tools in here, they they work fairly well, but um, it's it's a little it's a little clunky sometimes, but it's an amazing piece of software. So you can see this is the image and the image view on the left. We can actually see and audition these and then see the blended result on the right. So that's pretty nice. And you can see it did a really good job. Now, getting into what we can do later, and I'll do this at the end, is a little bit of retouching. So this allows us to select a source image. Let's say that it, it brought in the wrong piece of this. I can bring in a source image, like this one here, for example, or this one. and and I can clone it from one side to the other. So you can see I can start to do that. So if there's something glaring, a big mistake on there, you can fix it. And this really starts to come into effect with lights. So see this, for example, we find the, the background focus. You can see this little bit of light here, a little bit of light here. So this stuff tends to happen. So if you need to fix that, we can just bring in that layer. And th these are minor things. And there's one that is a really clear example of that. When this is done, I'll save it. Now the input for this, uh, I recommend outside of, uh, to get it outside of Lightroom, DxO, Capture One as a 16-bit TIFF. Uh, it'll do a way better job. Not a way better job. It, the Helicon Focus reads raw files, but you just get everything out as a 16-bit TIFF. If you want to pre-adjust things, pre-adjust things. It doesn't matter either way. Um, but if we take a look at this, I'm just going to save it into the rendered column. And it's it's actually that easy. So that's a three stage. Let's let's bring in something a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'll go ahead and delete these. So we'll move these in here. And that's fine. And I'll bring in more. You could do multiple projects with this. So let's try the four stage. And we'll take a look at this one. Okay. So we have all four in here. And again, auditioning. It's going to render those in. 
these are 16 bit TIFFs, uh, actually shot with the medium format Fujifilm 100S. So it's uh, a little, little bit of a beefy camera. So when it's a little laggy, you'll it's basically one of the highest resolution cameras and bit rate is on the market right now. So again, see, this is going to take a little bit longer because they're bigger files, but what we're going to be able to see is the edges. So it's detecting and rolling through the image and figuring out what the Z depth is. And some images, your iPhone contain LIDAR, uh, but this one's actually is, and you can actually show uh, depth map. So from the images, you can actually show what it's using or what it's looking for. And this obviously can look a little complicated if you're not used to it, but don't worry about it if it's not making a whole lot of sense. You can kind of see that it's just working or not. Now, the nice thing about this is 99 out of 100 times, it just works. And there's a little issue here and we can clean it. So let's go ahead and save this one too so that we can edit them at the end. I'll go ahead and save. I'll run 10 minutes over just to make up for the Florida weather. So we'll go ahead and save this too. All right, so now that we've done some easy ones, let's talk about some that are a little bit more complicated. Let's go ahead and remove all these images. Yes, perfect. We have this one, here we go. Now this one was a little bit more, man, I, let's just say to be completely honest, I wasn't sure if this was gonna work. Um, I was fairly confident that it would work, but there was no way for me to sort of Guarantee. It was kind of an experiment. It's the first time I used the 45 to 100 uh, GFX, Fujifilm GFX lens uh, and took advantage of this near focal distance, but I wasn't sure if it was going to come together. Now, the difficulty was, oh, there's somebody in the background, that always happens, is that from here to the end is so huge that there were a lot of little elements in between. So comparing these together and really taking a look at this full focus area, as I start to move through these, you can see the differences. So smaller differences between this, this, so the leaves themselves, and then also the middle ground and the background. So quite a bit of variation for that. And I wanted to make sure that I got them all. And in this case, did I need them all? Maybe. Maybe not, but I have them. Um, and I do have alternate exposures. This is up. So, so you know, this is, this is uh, my team, right? This is F Stoppers team. We're, we're filming, photographing the world, Japan in November. So, guys, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. Am I in the shot? Yes. Step out of the shot. Can you move your tripods? Yes. And they moved them over here. So, they're still in the shot. So, I'll have to remove those as well in the tutorial. So these are all set. We have a different stage. Again, if we look at these, I just want to point out, these are huge files, right? So we're looking at 600 megs each. We'll just go ahead and drag them into here and let's see what happens. So this is a lot more complex. There are a lot more fine details here for it to pick up. Again, default settings, method C, you're going to start noticing a pattern here that it just, it just works. Wonderful. Okay, so getting in on these details a little bit, we'll take a look. Uh, throughout this image, <laughs> this is a lag that, um, uh, you, it's not just you seeing this lag because of my internet, I'm getting this lag too. So we see this area here. I can identify there's some issues here on the tip of this leaf. And this is what you wanna watch out for. And the retouching, it, it's, it's really good, right? It, everything's looking really nice, really, really solid. But then we'll arrive at certain things like this. So see this accumulation of light? The reason that's happening is because it's an addition here. It's not actually out of focus. For some reason, it's treating these things, these white areas, as effective sort of glowing areas of light. So when you have light in the scene, select the image, the image on the left here, which is the background, and you can just paint those right out. Or, I mean, if we really want to get technical about it, paint the background image back in. And you can see the result here, very minor, but these little things kind of add up. And if you notice some other areas where the light's kind of accumulating, remember anything that's the infinite background, obviously you can just kind of paint right in. Things like this uh, get a little bit more complicated. We'll zoom in on that just to, just to show. I feel sometimes, 
that this is a little too clunky for its own good. Oh, in this case, this is going to be a little bit more difficult. This is probably this layer. So it's either the layer itself. There it is. So you can see I can put that back in. Now, here's the difficult part. So notice that when I start to paint that, I get the background too. So what I'll need to do is, is mask this, like a hard mask line. And I can either do that in Photoshop or here in, in Helicon Focus. But so it's almost, it's, it's you would say, kind of near perfect, right? Except for these little pieces. And kind of looking at it in totality of everything put together and just the image itself, if this is a display resolution and you're using social media, Instagram, or people aren't going to be zooming in on this or walking up to a large print, I don't think anybody would notice. But if you notice, uh, you should probably change it. We'll render this one out too. Just give it a quick save and save it. I'm saving them all as we go. We'll test it a couple more times and then we'll edit these together. And also this is really kind of important <clears throat> because this is a, sort of a blending situation. You'll notice that most of the settings in terms of frame to frame are pretty much the same. Like this, for example, I, I locked the camera settings and it goes from here to here but I didn't do any color correction. So nothing's really happening uh, in terms of the develop module or some pre-editing because I'd have to kind of regulate it. So there's not a wrong way to do it. You can do your pre-editing. If the highlights are blown out, you can regulate everything before you send it over. That's perfectly fine. But if everything looks fine, remove your camera distortion and kind of go with it. So the 16 level one, which uh, is an image that I've actually never finished. It was just an experiment. This is 2017, I think I started experimenting with this stuff when I, I started using uh, Helicon Focus. All right, so we got all these new images in. Wow, okay, that's a lot. Let's go ahead and get these out so it doesn't get confused. All right, so we'll go ahead and do that one more time for user error sake. Okay, let's do this again. Default settings, method C. Now you can see, see that creeping backwards effect. Isn't that, isn't that really cool? Like it, it just, it amazes me sometimes what we can do with this because it opens up a lot of possibilities in the field. So um, Himeji is an amazing castle, can be a little difficult to shoot as well, um, just because there aren't as many sort of surrounding, uh, you know, around shots like we just saw with Osaka Castle, which can look uh, incredibly different. There are a lot of ways that you can sort of put this together. Um, Himeji Castle doesn't have uh, a good set of trees where you can go through it, but there are levels of trees looking all the way back to the back courtyard. So this is probably three levels of trees throughout 100 meters or 150 meters. Again, different way of thinking about it, and we'll save this too. So at this point, we kind of see that almost whatever we throw at this nice piece of software, Helicon Focus works pretty well. So I know it's going to work on these. And I know it's going to work because it does the alignment by itself. It takes care of almost everything uh, that we need to take care of. And again, if you don't want to do these manually, like if we want to use something like this, we can do these same things uh, you know, with the Iceland two stage and everything. But since I did those in Photoshop, um, I can just merge them down into a single layer, for example. This one, uh, what I actually try to avoid, we can use the crop tool. I don't necessarily like to do that, but a quick way to do this, this wasn't really an, a normal part of it, is to just go to a canvas size. And if you take, you know, let's just make this uh, 82. Whoops, sorry. Let me do that again. Relative. So we just do 8200. Oh, let me cancel that. Sorry. Mm -mm. can decide. All right, so probably just want to take 100 off. So 81 and 60. And I'll just kind of come in on this. So proceed and come in a little bit more too. So that's basically what I'm doing is just a canvas size on this. So we'll just do 6,000 and 8,100. And I'm just kind of cropping in from all sides. So something like that works really well once you have of it, you can obviously put it together and start editing it. Now, the ones that we've been sort of adding up here, and I'll go ahead and show those under render. Let's see what we have. So we have this one twice, which is fine. So we'll go ahead and get rid of one of them. And let's go ahead and talk about some of these adjustments. So we have three. 
And the next course that I'm teaching at 2.30, maybe, <laughs> I'm sure if there's going to be power, these are all recorded too. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll cut out the downtime parts. I want to show some different editing tools, but I also want to talk uh, more specifically about the effect of the editing itself. So for example, uh, not just all of the techniques or technical parts of a tool, but more the reason why that we're editing it. Um, and this is a really cool example. I'll move my, um, my Zoom tools out of the way. This is Radiant Photo. This is the software that I in part developed and it works pixel by pixel but also scene detection. And this is just to kind of give these images a quick path. And what it does is it corrects the exposure and the color independently, uh, which is really useful. And I'll go back to the quick edit, close the zoom tools, which is really useful as a starting point. So again, this was sort of straight out of camera with the Fujifilm color applied, something like this too. So you're just gonna right out of the gate, it's gonna give you the clarity, um, sort of that image uh, exposure and tone really quickly. And it's a good starting point. So it works. The smart editing is the uh, the AI, uh, the less evil version. It's not Skynet or uh, something crazy that's adding a bunch of features. But what's nice about this is if you are tired of using the develop module or you want something a little bit more accurate, we can go in and correct color. And you can see that subtle effect independently from exposure and something else that this tool has over other tools is we can we can adjust that exposure without blowing out highlights and blacks because in lightroom i'm sure you're like me and every time you move the exposure slider and it blows out your highlights you say thank you because that's what i wanted uh, of course i wanted to blow out my highlights said no one so we can just quickly add some depth and some color a little bit of vibrancy to these and i'm just doing some quick editing here on the fly just so we can we can get some uh some nice clean results very quickly from here to here. And what's nice about it too is, is once we sort of apply this, uh, this one could use a little bit more depth, uh, some more color and some vibrancy. You can see how fast this is just to put it together. We can start to, to sort of build this up in phases. So just to kind of review here, I have some fairly, fairly complicated ones. Let's go ahead and save this one out too. We'll bring this one into Radiant Photo. This is a, uh, I, I just want to point out that sometimes if you're in Japan and you're shooting the castles during Haname or the cherry blossom festivals, which last a few weeks, for a while there, they were getting into the idea of illuminating the castles with blue light. So it's not, I don't think it looks good at all. <laughs> but for a while they kind of did so maybe some more image surgery in here but you can see how the color is not just removing the blue but it's adding some warmth here in the foreground taking this off and so we can just kind of apply sort of a nice baseline effect to this and the way that i'm treating this again when i'm shooting it's pretty much the same you can keep your camera and aperture priority like i do or you can lock the white balance you can do everything that you can uh, especially if it's a dynamically changing scene but what you really want to make sure of is that one in a shot like this, uh, there's minimal wind. The way that I handle that when I'm shooting through trees is even if there's a little bit of a breeze, I wait for it. So I'll shoot it and then I'll wait for it to kind of pause and then I'll shoot through the brackets. The key part is making sure that it's fast enough. So if you're at night shooting at night, I'll tend to shoot it's 800 ISO, 1600 ISO so that I can make sure that I'm freezing everything. So it's really important because those edges need to line up. And when they don't, there are a lot of little things to fix. But basically for this, here's an example, you can see that's just sort of shot one, two, three, and four, just to be able to get these different points, right? And that's really where you have to go into the camera a little bit and sort of determine which ones are needed. And if you're not sure, I'd say most of it can be uh, most of it can be accomplished with two. two. If you're not sure, three. So back, middle, front, front, or front, middle, back, depending on things where it's narrow, less shot, or you want to do a little turns instead of focus, the internal things. Every camera different. some of them are very unintuitive, some of them are very intuitive. So I can't really describe that feature for you because all, all of your cameras are going to be different. Just know it's there. 
Um, most cameras don't assemble it for you. And if they do, it may or may not be a raw file. So as we're recording this, Sony's probably working on another solution for this. Until then, it's Helicon Focus. But just to show, and um, in the develop here, we could go into any one of these photos and change this. So you can make these changes, apply it across, send it to Helicon Photo or Photoshop, and that's going to be fine. Just try to make sure that everything's close. So unedited, if it works fine, that's good for this. It may be just the whites, right? And then we can sync all of them. But make sure that it's close enough because Helicon Focus is looking for a frequency difference of pixels, assuming that it's not a wildly different exposure. It usually works, but then it's going to get a little confused. And even if it does read the focus areas to get that right, you're going to end up with uh, parts of images that look completely different. So from editing from raw into here and then into Photoshop, into Radiant Photo and sort of your normal, normal way to do that. So for something like this, I can just use the Radiant Photo filter and we can start point there. But again, there's so many ways to do the same thing in Photoshop, depending on how far you want to push it. And the next course is going to dive into a few of those techniques that I like to use regularly. You see the before and after there. That's a little weird, even though it's a natural cloud. We'll talk a little bit about vibrance and just the overall uh, wow factor that we're creating in images. I, what makes that wow factor? So that's the sort of adding vibrancy to images without overdoing it. And uh, I uh, feel optimistic about the uh, the power. So if you're tuning in again or, or you, you stayed with me <laughs> during this, thank you for that because, yeah, that was an experiment in, um, well, I don't even know. It doesn't usually happen. I think that may be the first time uh, during one of these that it's actually happened or happened more than once very quickly. So let's see if anybody's still with me. I see we have you guys that did stick with me. Thanks. If we have any questions, uh, we'll go ahead and extend a little bit now um, just because they are recording this. So I'll wait a second. If you guys have something to put in the chat, to ask questions or directly in the Q&A. Uh, again, yeah. I'm here and it looks like I can message you guys directly. Pause for questions and green tea. Again, just Japanese theme all day. No questions. I mean, it can be about hair care. <laughs> Doesn't have to be about photography. No? All right. Well, that's awesome, guys. I really I think we were able to cover a lot here uh, in a really short amount of time. And you can see I, actually all of the ones I ended up with, this is in Japan. It, I guess uh, this technique I kind of developed while I was there to overcome these problems. But a lot of these photos you haven't seen. This is part of photographing the world, as is this. Um, but I encourage you to kind of go out and experiment with this a little bit. Um, I think, <laughs> I think that it's, it's a fun way to see the world through a telephoto lens, but also get uh, overcoming the technical aspects, the technical aspects are not difficult. Um, but I would say that, you know, obviously it's critical to putting it back together. So less is more, but when you're in the field, uh, you know, take all of those levels of focus as you can. Another, uh, focus bracketing, where can I find a more basic coast? Uh, Lori, I'll, I'll answer your question, uh, as well. So. When you're doing a single photo, background, foreground, right? If it's like uh, the image that's on screen here, it's pretty easy to determine what the foreground and background are. But if you're shooting this and you're shooting it over and over again as the light changes, uh, you kind of want to find a pattern to it. And the way that I teach, uh, and and Laurie, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll be releasing Photographing the World Japan. These are images that are included, and I teach that in the field. Uh, my process is to start with the background and move forward. But the other thing that I like to do, uh, whether it's three, six, or 12 different brackets, um, I'll shoot the brackets. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then right in front of the camera, I'll put my hand like this and I'll just take a photo like this. Then I'll shoot it again and take a photo. The reason being is when you're in post, and Capture One has a way to sort of flag what's in focus, but it's not necessarily clear. And if you're mixing around, if you're shooting like, all right, I'm shooting this and I'm shooting different elements of it, and then I'm shooting these brackets and the camera doesn't move, you're going to have a really hard time identifying which set is with which image or which image set is all cohesive. Does that make sense? So in between, just I take just so that I know when I'm in Lightroom or Bridge or wherever, it's like I see, okay, here's the images, hand, images, hand, images, hand, images. It'll help you uh, stay a little bit more organized. Um, in terms of uh, 
hair care, which I have a nice uh, comment there. That's going to be, uh, you know, it's photographing the world uh, spa days, right? So that that's basically uh, if you if you watch photographing the world, that is uh, Lee Morris from F stops. F stopper is taking a three hour bath and then me getting a, a full perm. So may or may not be happening. But thanks. I appreciate the questions. I'm going to stop sharing. And yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me and sticking with me. And um, yeah, I'm feeling really optimistic about the power thing on. So again, 2.30 Eastern time, we'll go over some of the post-processing. I'll toss a couple of these images in uh, for you guys too, just for you uh, who are going to be joining me in the next session so we can take a, a deeper dive into uh, the way these images are edited.